Very nice. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. Brandon said to me, he said, the thing that I want you to share on is just the ordinary life of mission. How, how do you do that? How do you live a life of mission? Maybe share some stories from the past of how it is that the Lord has led you. And so that's what I'm going to do. I, I, I love coming here. I love being with your leaders. I love being here with you on Sundays and Saturdays. This is the passage the Lord gave me just to reflect on as I thought about this morning. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. That probably is the closest picture of my life that I can find in the scriptures. A cracked pot. You've heard of cracked pots, haven't you? Well, I'm definitely one of those. And the reason that the light may be able to be seen is simply because the vessel is flawed and what's inside gets to be seen on the outside. For me, my early years were years that were often framed by frustration and failure. All the way through school, I struggled with something that they weren't really sure of at the time, but now we're very familiar with. Uh, it's a thing called dyslexia. And um, it meant that all of the normal testing and metrics that they used to find out where kids were on their educational journey really didn't work with me because I, I couldn't read. At the age of 11, I had the reading age of a seven-year-old. And so as I entered high school, I was basically incapable of doing the things that I was asked to do. And it caused a huge frustration because in a class-ridden society like Britain that I come from, really, you have to find your place within the social order. And if you're constantly failing, then generally you gravitate toward the bottom. And so the only place that I could stand was at the bottom of this educational ladder looking up at everyone else. Around about the age of 15, to kind of compound my frustration, I found myself really wanting to be a better person. It wasn't a matter of being better at my books, better at my studies. I wanted to be a better person because something in me was convincing me, convicting me, that I needed to make that journey. I looked at other people, I realized that often they lived much more generous and kind lives than the one I would lead. You see, the Spirit of God was working on me, convicting me. There were really no connections with Christians. There's no connection with church. There was nobody in my known family network that was a Christian. It's a very familiar pattern in Britain today. And then one day, a teacher from America lent me a Bible. And I decided I would read it from cover to cover. I'd never read a book from cover to cover in my life. And unbeknown to me, God had done a thing that sometimes happens with dyslexics. He had rewired my brain without me knowing it. It was an incredible gift to me. And so the very first book that I ever read and that ever committed myself to reading was the Bible. And I became a Christian by reading it. I became a follower of Jesus and very rapidly realized 
that God was calling me. I, I read the stories in the scriptures and clearly there was a conversation between the people in the Bible and God himself. God would speak to them as they, as they spoke to God and it wasn't until years later that I went to theological college that of course people tried to tell me that that didn't happen anymore and so I just assumed that it would happen then and I spoke to God and I heard him speaking to me. And this is what God said to me. He said, I've called you to be a missionary. So I thought, okay, I'll do that, whatever that is. I didn't know what that was. So at the age of 18, I went to seminary. I came out from seminary at the age of 21. A year later, Sally finished her courses at university, and we got married, and we moved into our life of mission. As young people, we went to the poorest community in Britain, a community called Brixton, which now is a marvellously gentrified community in London, but then was, on the social register of deprivation, the very lowest. We took some missionaries with us, and we felt that this was the place that God had called us to go and do mission, but we had no idea how to do it, or what we should do or say. So we decided, after some thought and prayer, that the best thing to do would be to ask the community what they thought we should do. If we couldn't come up with an idea, maybe they would have an idea. So we put together a little questionnaire. It wasn't a kind of a creepy one where we, we snuck in the four spiritual laws. We really, really had a proper questionnaire. We went around to as many of the homes that we could speak to, mostly in apartment blocks there in that, in that inner urban community. And the main questions that we asked were, what's great about this community? What's bad about this community? And how, how do you think the church should function? What do you think we should do? What do you think our emphasis should be? Well, it was very clear that everybody in the community said that we should do children's work and youth work. Nobody could agree on what was best about the community. And everybody agreed on what was worst. You see, what we were discovering was one of the crucial lessons of the life of mission. And that is this. The good news that we carry is only good news to people if they understand what you're saying to them. And so you have to, you have to hear their vocabulary of good and bad news. What's good and bad news to your friends? What's good and bad news to Roseville? What's good and bad news to the people that you know? We were trying to find out what was good and what was bad news to this community. The good news, well, they said it's diverse. It's got great shops. It's got, it's got buses that we can get everywhere. But the bad news was very clear. The bad news was that they had rubbish on the streets. Trash on the streets was the number one bad news for the community. 95%, more than 95% of the people that we surveyed said it was rubbish on the streets. And I came back to the church and spoke to Sally and the team and I said, everybody here is mad. They're all bonkers. This has the highest level of infant mortality in the country. It has the highest level of street crime in the country. It has the highest level of deprivation in the country. It has the highest level of everything that's bad in the country. And they're worried about litter. <laughs> they're mad. Well, they all looked back at me and let me get that off my chest. And then we started to talk rationally and think it through and pray it through. Because clearly there was something that was being said to us that we just couldn't hear. So as we pressed in and we thought and prayed, it became very clear that this community believed that they were the trash can of London. That if you found yourself living here, you'd never get out. You were the discarded rubbish of the country. And this is the way that they saw themselves and this is the way they lived. And when they stepped out of their homes and they saw the evidence on the streets, they knew that they were trash. 
and nobody was prepared to tell them otherwise. Well, there were probably 40 people in the congregation at the time and we didn't really know what to do about it, but we decided that we'd have a go and do something. A guy called Graham Kendrick, who was a well-known worship leader at the time, was doing a thing called the Jesus March, where he would go into different communities and people would sing and praise, and it was great. And we thought, well, maybe we could use that, but I think we probably need to do more than just sing on the streets, because clearly there's stuff on the streets that people think that we should be doing something about. So we decided on one Sunday in August, we'd have church in the morning, we'd have lunch straight after church, and then we would have our very first praise and litter march. We got a thing called a ghetto blaster. You kids have never seen one or even heard about it. It's about as big as a suitcase. It carries about 20 pounds of batteries. And it plays a cassette. You've never seen one of those either. On my 12-string guitar... The youth worker on the upright piano, we recorded as many songs as we knew. We put the cassette into the ghetto blaster. We strapped the ghetto blaster to a baby, baby stroller. For some unknown reason, for some unknown reason, we decorated the baby stroller with balloons. <laughs> and we stepped out onto the street. But we were all terrified. I mean, let's be honest. We're all English. And I was the most English of the English. And it suddenly felt like a really, really bad idea. It wasn't quite praise and litter. It was more whisper and litter. I stepped out onto the street. And it was, Hosanna. Hosanna. That was the, that was the big song at the time. Hosanna in the highest. But as we got into it, and we started picking up the litter, we all wore rubber gloves and carried a bin liner with us. It, it kind of felt like the spirit was filling our lungs and we were getting into it. And we began to sing and the people on the street, they began to twitch their curtains and look out and see what we were doing. And we were gathering up the litter one of the doors flung open and uh, a lady stepped onto the, onto the step. She said, Oi, vicar, what are you doing? It's the middle of London. That's the way they talk in London. What are you doing, vicar? Come here. So I, I went over. She said, what are you doing? I said, well, you know the questionnaire? Yeah. And, and you know we asked about, you know, what was the bad thing? Yeah. And, and you know everybody said, litter on the streets. Yeah. Well, we decided we'd pick some of it up. No. I said, yeah. She said, no. I said, yes, no. Then she turned around and she went, hey, darling, come down here. The vicar's got rubber gloves on. So her husband comes down. He said, hello, vicar, what are you doing? I said, well, you know the question? He says, yeah. <laughs> and you know how people said, well, listen, yeah. Well, we decided to pick up, no. I said, yeah, no. He says, I think that's blooming marvellous. He says, I'll make you a cup of tea. So he puts the kettle on and tells his neighbours, come and see what the vicar's doing. He's clearing up our street. So it's like a celebration after the Second World War. People coming out with piping hot trays of tea and cookies and everybody's helping us and some of the people are singing along and picking up the stuff with us. It was fantastic. We did it every month. Through the summer, people swelled our ranks, began to come to church, and it began to feel like God was doing something because we were sharing good news in a way that made sense. One day we were in a children's playground clearing up the glass that the kids had left behind. Obviously it's not a good thing to have broken glass where the kids are playing so we're clearing that all up and a guy came to me and he said hey vicar you all right yeah he said you're very clever you are i said oh thank you he said yeah i know you're very very clever it's a parabola isn't it i said sorry 
He said, it's a parabola. What you're doing? I said... Uh, uh. He said, you know, one of those stories that Jesus told his disciples, it's a parabola. <laughs> it's one of them, isn't it? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, what you're saying to us is that God wants to clean up our lives because we can't do it ourselves. And I went, yeah, that's exactly what it is that you're doing. <laughs> and he begins, he begins to well up and his tears in his eyes and they begin to come down his cheeks. He said, do you think God could do that for me? And he came to Christ right there. So as we're, we're moving along, we're, we're really trying to do the best we can and live out the life of mission. But of course, you hit all kinds of obstacles along the way. The enemy most certainly isn't going to just kind of roll over and play dead. And we discovered that there was a terrible thing that had happened in the church. The new teenagers that were joining the church that were getting saved someone who we'd brought onto the team was accused of sexually abusing them. And it was just a terrible tragedy for the families. It went to court. It was just awful. And I was, I was walking around the, the area. In, in Church of England, they give you a, a, a geographical area that you're responsible for called a parish. So I was walking around my parish complaining to God, saying, what are you doing? What's happening? And probably because I wasn't able to hear him in my heart because it was so full of questions and difficulties, God had to speak in another way. One of the very few times I've heard an audible voice out loud. And it was almost like a riddle. God said, what did the early church do? And I, it was so loud, I just went, excuse me? I'm sure people must have thought I was crazy, but I realized that the Lord was provoking me. What did the early church do? I knew that the early church were accused of incest because the reputation was that there was love between brothers and sisters. I know that the early church was accused of cannibalism because they ate the body and blood of their leaders. I know that they were accused of anti-authoritarianism because they had a king other than Caesar. And so those were the reasons why there was an open season on Christians and it was a publicly proclaimed encouragement to kill as many as you could. And yet, the church grew. So how did they do that? I mean, how does, how does any organization grow when there's that kind of opposition? And I realized I had no answer for that. And I realized that there must be a reason and a way that Jesus trained his first disciples that really was something I didn't understand that helped them continue to do mission in the midst of real brokenness and real challenge and real opposition, the kinds of things that I was beginning to see but really were only tiny percentages of what the early church saw. And so I went back to the scriptures and I began to look and I noticed in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke that the twelve were sent out to do a particular mission with a, with a particular method. And then I noticed in Luke 10 that the 72 disciples beyond the twelve were sent out to do precisely the same thing. And the key strategy was to find one person in whom God was already working called the person of peace. Well, this was an amazing discovery for me. And so I began to teach the church and I said, I think the person of peace is a person who likes you, listens to you and serves you. And I, some people asked me to write it down on, in some, some books and shared that with a few other people. And lots of people know the person of peace strategy today. I was in the back garden and um, I, I was trying to do dad things as well as other stuff and the backyard was just full of broken glass and you know it's all overrun and I'd got this mower from the church that had got a demon and um, 
And it was, it, I'd, I'd, have you ever used one of those old gas mowers that it, they get hot and then if you turn them off at that point, you can't get them on again until they get cool like a, another day. So I'm, I'm out there, you know, I'm wrestling with this demonized mower and there's this kid who, who's walking past the, the fence and he's waving at me, trying to get my attention. And I know that if I talk to him, I'm going to have to leave the mower behind. I'll never get it started again. So I'm trying to ignore him, you know, as a Christian should. And, um, and he's going, Oi, Vicar! Vicar! Hey! Oi! Oi, Vicar! So eventually, okay, I'll have to do it tomorrow. I walk over. Yeah, hi. He said, I was just saying hello. <laughs> well, I, you know, the mower calls down. I try it the next day. I'm out there the next day. Guess who comes by again? <laughs> hey, Vicar! Hi! I mean, really loud. Eventually, I, I go over and, are you all right? Yeah. What are you doing? I'm mowing the lawn or where I was. I mean, I'm not going to be able to now. Oh. I was just checking. He didn't have anything to say. There was nothing that he wanted to talk about. I went into the house and I said, Sal, what's the rule about killing people? Is there, is there a rule about that? And, you know, I was kind of going off on this kid and saying, you know, he drives me mad. He's out there every time he stops me. She said, you know that stuff you've been teaching us about the person of peace? <laughs> and I just, oh, no, he's my person of peace. And I didn't realize I'd been teaching everybody else to find one and he's, here's one coming to me. So the next day I was out there mowing, waiting, mowing, waiting. The next day I was out there mowing, waiting. He's not there. The next day I'm out there, four days later, he comes hobbling past. The grass is bald. The garden's <laughs> been fixed days ago. And I go over and say, hey, he's got a cast on his leg. I said, what happened? He said, oh, I got run over just after talking to you. <laughs> I thought, wow, we've we're got battle for lives here. I better get on with this one. So I'm just asking him questions and talking to him. And you, know, and you ask kids stuff, don't you? You say, well, what are you going to do when you grow up? And he says, well, I'm going to be a professional guitarist. So oh. I said, have you, what, what kind of guitar have you got? He said, oh, I, I don't have a guitar yet. I said, oh. He said, but I don't need. He said, he said yeah, I'm going to get one at the weekend. I'm a, I'm a musical prodigy. I'm like a genius. <laughs> he said, I can do anything, play anything, read anything, do everything by ear, do it. I can do everything. So. And I'm thinking, I need to back away here. This is kind of, you know. And he said, he said you've got a music group in your church, haven't you? I said, yeah. He said, do you need a guitarist? I said, you know what? We don't. <laughs> we don't. It's funny, you know, but thanks anyway. He says, well, I, you know, I don't. he said, you don't have to plug me in. I'll just, I'll just play along with people. <sighs> they like you. They listen to you. They want to serve you. So I thought, I'll make it as hard as possible. I said, you'd have to be there at 8.30. He said, no problem. He was there just after 8. Incidentally, he was unbelievably brilliant. And he is a professional guitarist today. And he's the administrator of the church. And he led all of his family to Christ. And they became missionaries to India. Go figure. Go figure. So here's the thing. So here's the thing. Fruitfulness, we know, depends upon abiding. Yeah? You know the picture, don't you, from John 15? The vine and the branches. 
The branches bear fruit because they abide in the vine. But abiding depends upon pruning. Why does it depend upon pruning? Because the branch will naturally think about its branchliness rather than the fact that it's connected to the vine. It just does that. And so the gardener, our father, cuts the branch so that we stop thinking about ourselves and start thinking more about Jesus and abide in him and then grow and bear fruit. It's called pruning. It's called nub theology. Not branch theology, but nub theology. The branch gets cut off and it's just a nub. And it can't really think about itself anymore. Well, that's been the pattern of my life. I'm this bag full of insecurities. I mean, we all got dropped on our head as babies, didn't we? <laughs> so I'm this bag full of insecurities. I, I'm not very good at doing certain things like public stuff and writing. And yet, 27 books later, here we are. I mean, who'd have thought? Isn't that crazy? Well, I was getting tired and worn down, and the Lord said, okay, time to prune the branch, and you need to go on retreat. So I went on retreat. I borrowed a friend's little RV, and I went off to a place called Wales, up into the hills, fasting and praying, asking God, give me a new vision. And as I was driving along, I saw myself carrying a cross, and I said, yes, Lord, that's it. I need to, I need to take up my cross and follow you. I believe that, Lord. But what do you want me to do? I, I, I want to know what that means for this place, for me, for now. So I walk through the hills and I fast and I pray and I go through the forest and I fast and I pray. Nothing. I get to the end of the week, I'm thinking, I've got, I've got to go home. I've got nothing. I pulled in at one last place, last forest, beautiful. I climbed through the forest, got onto a rock, stood on the rock. Felt like the Lord gave me a, a verse from Hosea. Break up your unplowed ground, for it's time to seek the Lord until he showers blessings upon you. I saw myself carrying a cross. And I said, you mean it, don't you? You want me to carry a cross through the community? This was the moment. I said, okay, I will. And at that moment, now I know that at this point, when I tell you this next thing, you're going to think, okay, he's bonkers. I'm not listening to the rest. Because what I heard was an angel behind me. And he went, he's got it. We can go. <laughs> it's like for the whole week, they'd been going, what is the matter with him? We keep giving him this vision and he doesn't get it. So I get back and I tell Sally, and she says, sounds like the Lord to me. And I said, so you're going to come then, hey? She said, no. Because <laughs> I've not heard that. You heard that. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, fair enough. So I, I went to the team, you know, this little team of missionaries that were with me and prayed with them and told them the thing and said, so what do you think? They went, yep, sounds like the Lord. So I said, you know, you're going to come too? Nope. <laughs> I said, no, not really. I mean, you know, you don't have to come, obviously, but what do you think? Nope. Not heard that. So Monday came, and I'm outside in the church parking lot building a cross, big enough for me. So there's big, big pieces of wood and people are looking out from their windows wondering what's going on. And I mean, I've never carried a cross before. I don't know how you carry a cross. And they're really heavy. I mean, I don't know if you ever, but it's really heavy. And I got it all kind of backwards. I, I did the long part out front first when I was doing the little practice run. And I caught it on a curb and nearly pole vaulted over the church. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, I turned that around and you get the long part out the back and... And I stepped out onto the street from the parking lot, which is behind the church. 
And it was like one of those movies. You know those Western movies where the guy walks into the saloon and everything stops and the piano stops? And, well, it's this, this, this little kind of community. You know, everybody lives there. Everybody's kind of cheek by jowl. Everybody knows everybody. And I, I come out onto the pavement and it's like the place comes to a standstill. And everybody's looking at me. And I, I get up onto the street corner and I'm trying to balance the cross and I've got my Bible and Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And people are just kind of looking at me. You could see on their faces, what is he doing? There's a lady three floors up. She's at the open window. And she went, the vicar's gone mad. <laughs> so I, I got to the next corner. And I thought, oh, I'll try another one. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nothing. I, w I walked past a little coffee shop. The youth pastor's in there going, pray. <laughs> so the next day, I, I do the same thing. Nobody there. Out again, trying. Gospel bullet. No response. Next day, nobody walking around, trying these little gospel words. I think it was the fourth day an old lady came. She said, I'll pray for you, Pastor. I said, thanks. <laughs> so, we're, so we're out on the, on the street, and she's praying for me, and people are beginning to kind of listen and gather around a bit and kind of nod. And, and then the next day, there's a few other people join me, mostly women, guys. The guys always seem to have some kind of really important excuse. But little by little, people began to respond. Little by little. It's like a blowtorch on an iceberg, but little by little, people began to respond. And people began to say, and, and so where do you go to church? And what is it you believe in? What is it you do? And little by little, the trickle came in. Well, I've not shared this with any of the other congregations. I said to Brandon earlier, I, I need to sit down somewhere. So he took me upstairs and found a bathroom for me to sit in. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> found an office for me to sit in. And I, I said, Lord, what, 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 is there anything else? Well, you know that pruning thing? You know, I was really beginning to see lots of people really wanting to know Jesus. And then I heard the Lord say, I want you to carry the cross through the night watches and I want you to pray for your community through the night. So I said to Sally, what do you think? She said, sounds like the Lord. I said, are you going to come? She said, Somebody's got to look after the children whilst you're walking around the community. <laughs> Remember, we've got children? Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so the night came, midnight, got the cross, stepped out onto the street. There's hardly anybody there. The few that were there gave me a wide berth. And I remember I was walking down one of the streets, and I just sensed that there was something following me, and I... I looked around and there was a police cruiser just right behind me. <laughs> and he got out and he's, he's English, Bobby. Evening, sir. Can I ask exactly what it is that you're doing? Uh, well, I, officer, I'm the vicar of the area and I'm praying for my community. Yes. Do you normally do that in the middle of the night, sir? No, but I think it's the right thing to do. Hmm. Do you normally do it with this large cross, sir? <laughs> no, but, you know. He said, well, do be careful there, sir. He got back in the car and drove off. And I walked around the area and went back home and thought nothing of it. Thought, I think I did what God told me to do. The next day, one of the team that was with me on the prayer walk knocked on a door 
And a man cracked open the door and said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. Come in. He stepped inside. It was an old, old man. The story began. He said, he said my name's Matthew. I've lived here since the war. And I'm a survivor from one of the concentration camps. And he says, there's my number. He said, last night, I was saying to God, I, I know I haven't got long. You see, I'm, I'm dying. And I said to God, will you show me the Messiah? I, I, I want to know. I want to understand who the Messiah is. Who's the Messiah? He said, I, I got up and I, I pulled back the curtains. And there was a man carrying a cross down the street. And I said, it's Jesus, isn't it? And he said to the guy who came to me, he said, it's Jesus, isn't it? And he said, yeah. And he prayed and became a follower of Jesus and died three days later. <laughs> I wonder how flawed you feel you are. I wonder how disqualified you feel you are. I wonder how broken you feel you are. You, you feel like, really, you, you don't know how to really do this witnessing thing. You're not very good at it. Do you know, honestly, I'm terrible at it. But I, I don't think that matters. I think what matters is that we surrender and we make ourselves available so that God can do his mission through us because he's good at it. Do you know what I mean? He's always been good at it. And the amazing thing is he wants to partner with us. Imagine that. So my sense is this, and I've prayed about this all weekend, and I think Brand has helped me with this. My sense is, is that there are some here, and maybe they're people like me, people of all ages, of course, and all of you from different backgrounds. But maybe some of you are like me, who have longed to be on mission with Jesus, but you just don't feel particularly equipped or very good. And maybe you feel disqualified. You know, maybe your thought life isn't what it should be, and maybe your past kind of makes you feel ashamed. And Jesus wants to use you. So if that's you, then come down and let's pray together. Shall we do that? Let's pray together. If that's you, then you should come on. People will let you past. Come on. If that's you, then just come and join. And let's pray together. And as you as you pray. I know that you may be conscious of your failings and failures, your past and your baggage. All of those 
are cracks in the clay that let the glory out. Isn't that amazing? My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. Lord, we're weak. We're inadequate to the task. We're incapable of doing the work. And yet, Lord, you choose us. And so, Lord, we say we're grateful. We're glad, Lord, that you want to use us. Thank you. It's amazing. And, Lord, I pray for these dear friends. I pray that this day, in this moment of consecration, that you would, Lord, encourage their hearts. Lead them out. And Lord, yeah, we know that we're going to stay humble because what else could we be? But Lord, use us. Shine through us, Lord. Make your name known through us, Lord. And bring glory to yourself. Pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen.